Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, this webinar is a part of the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts Regional Heritage Stewardship Program. This program is an initiative funded through the National Endowment for the Humanities, pursued in close partnership with the Utah Division of Arts and Museums and Utah Humanities. The RHSP program is an initiative focused on bringing preservation, education, and resources to the Intermountain West region of the United States. This webinar will be recorded and all registrants will receive the link to that within about a week or so. And we just ask that you please hold all questions to the end of the presentation because we're gonna be following it up with a, a short Q&A session. And with that, I now pass it off to today's presenter, Sabrina Sanders. Hello, everybody. Glad you can join us. Um, I'm going to be talking about conducting an inventory of collections. And I will assume most of you are here because you have a need to perform an inventory of some manner at your organization. But whether you have a functioning and complete inventory already done and you need maintenance or you are starting from scratch, I hope this webinar gives you some good information on how to get started and the steps you can take for completing this important project. Uh, first, a little background on me. I work at the Utah Division of State History, which is also known as the Utah Historical Society. Uh, the Historical Society began in 1897 and started the collections soon thereafter. The collections hold everything from manuscripts and photographs to maps, books, architectural drawings, and artifacts, which is where my job focus lies. The artifact collection uh, has over 30,000 objects that are housed in the 110-year-old Rio Grande train depot in Salt Lake City. The artifact collection contains a large variety of types of objects, such as textiles and mining tools, furniture and farming implements to painting, jewelry, and housewares. Now, I happen to know we have 31,561 objects in the artifact collection because we did a complete inventory project starting back in 2013 and it gave me great first-hand experience in understanding the huge endeavor an inventory can be. The project took over four years and involved hiring four part-time staff, as well as utilizing one full-time staff as a daily manager, and then another full-time staff as an overall project manager who reported up to the directors. And I'm gonna use lessons learned and insert examples from this project but mostly I will talk about conducting an inventory in broader terms in the hopes that you can scale the information to your needs. So let's begin with some bigger picture concepts of why an inventory is important and then we'll get into some nuts and bolts of actually doing that inventory. What is an inventory? It is the verification of objects in your physical possession and why do an inventory? Well, we are the stewards of the collections held and they are held in the public trust for current and future generations. And inventory is at the core of almost everything we do as collecting institutions. So we need to know what is in the collection before we can interpret, exhibit, or share any of it in any meaningful way. Paraphrasing the national standards and best practices published by the AAM, know what stuff you have, know where it is, and take good care of it. Knowing what you have and where it is underlies decisions on accessions and deaccessions, storage, storage conditions, and if they need to be improved, loans, selection of exhibition projects, research, and also essential to deterring and detecting theft. And ultimately, it supports the mission of your organization. An inventory is central to access and preservation, which is a big picture goal in collection stewardship. It helps to preserve objects through knowing what you have and their condition an inventory can identify items that need conservation are ones that are a hazard, such as nitrate negatives, rust, or chemicals, or even live ammunition. 
knowing where it is allows better access. And we can even talk about the amount of time wasted in looking for objects. You know, like that watercolor made by an artist as a study before making the famous oil painting. Is it in your storage somewhere? Or that pants and cap that go with the World War I uniform jacket? They're in one of these boxes, right? Well, these examples may sound familiar to you and the inventory will help save you from those situations. Once you have decided to take on this inventory project, you will want to set your goals and that will give you structure and planning and set your path. In order for a collection inventory to succeed, it must have institution-wide buy-in from all levels. The goals you set will help achieve getting your organization on board with the task. And looking at some of the possible short and long-term goals listed here, uh, on the short-term list, you know, clean and organize. Any chance to do that is great. And that speaks to uh, the next item on the list, um, removing any non-collection items from the area as accessioned items. And you know, this will have future professionals who work in the same collections thanking you. I know in our inventory project, we ended up having to go through hundreds of items that were stored with the collections and then count them as collection objects then have to go back and make decisions later about their origins and their disposition. So do not discount this exercise. Um, it can also inform job descriptions by understanding what you have and where it is. You can define more clearly the job of a registrar or a collections manager or a curator and then what these positions entail for your organization. And pest control is a really important part of collections care. Going through the storage, examining the objects will bring knowledge if you have pests, what kind, and how to treat the issue. Um, creating an integrated pest management or IPM plan can be a really wonderful outcome also of doing an inventory. Uh, so then getting into some long-term goals, like I mentioned before, you have better access through knowing where it is and its condition. Uh, digitization, um, the hot topic, uh, collections care, and that's tied to having a digital image. And it goes a long way in preservation. You get into less handling. It also broadens access. Uh, you can think about creating digital exhibitions or using images on your web page, use it to write blogs, do social media posts, to name a few. Um, or maybe the purchase of a database, and maybe with cloud based storage is something you want to advocate. Um, having a current inventory of your collection brings out its value, therefore helping to promote the idea of a database and its supporting role in public access. An inventory can be useful for grant applications where you can utilize the information learned about the collection. As an example, um, my organization used the information gleaned from the inventory to advocate for a new collection storage space a new cloud hosted database and grants for things like taking part in the FAIC CAP program. Uh, you can gain institutional control of the collection for things like cost of insurance coverage, or if some sort of disaster occurs, heaven forbid, you have up to date records of what was lost or needs to be found. The collecting scope is better informed because you know what you have and where your shortfalls are. Uh, for, for example, you may find that mid 20th century is really well represented within your textile collection. So perhaps in your future acquisitions, you should focus more on late 19th century. Um, the storage needs of your collection and the capability of growth. So do you require more shelving and boxing? Are the painting storage getting too crowded? Can you even accept any more large size donations with the current storage space? So think about some of these goals and what you want to accomplish with an inventory. And then once you design, decide on your goals, you can think about what type of inventory you want to do.
There are a few types of inventories commonly done that you can utilize to achieve your goals. There's random or spot, which will usually just inventory a sampling of object types, such as you know, a few quilts that you have in storage or maybe unframed works on paper. A few um, pros of this type are that it is a brief project and it can verify locations. Um, also, a regular schedule of spot inventories can be really helpful in deterring theft. Some cons to random or spot inventory is that it's really only um, a small audit and it should probably be used after completing a full inventory. Uh, next, there are partial inventories, which are limited in scope and can be maybe a specific location, such as maybe a large exhibition um, or a particular storage location. This kind is useful for location and condition verification. And it's better than no inventory at all, but it could be useful for um, exhibition planning, or maybe you have to move an area of storage to make way for new shelving, but it will not give enough information to definitively reconcile against your records. A complete or full inventory will document every item that is in or is supposed to be in your collection, as well as anything in your custody, such as loans or temporary donations and the like. Identifying all items with their location will allow for the reconciliation with your records. The results will bring knowledge of what items have no record and then what records have no item. And I'll get into that a little bit more later in the webinar. So planning will be a fairly large time commitment in the scope of conducting an inventory. Um, it, it takes a, a large amount of time, but I've broken it down um, into these five steps and I'll go further into each one. So you have your goals in mind and you have the type of inventory that best suits these goals. So taking the time to plan your inventory project is so important. There will be many questions along the way and decisions will have to be made. So you will want them to be in line with your organization's mission. So you want to start by looking at your collections management policy. A good CMP will inform how to handle all those decisions along the way. And ideally, it'll have wording about conducting an inventory, like how often and the type. So do you have a collections management policy? If you do not have one or find it to be horribly out of date, I suggest you create one. Um, the books listed here are excellent resources. There's the Museum Registration Methods 5th edition known as the MRM5. There's Marie Malaro's A Legal Primer on Managing Museum Collections. There's uh, Things Great and Small Collections Management Policies by John Simmons as well. Um, the Regional Heritage Stewardship Program has great webinars available on their YouTube channel concerning collections management policies. And our Office of Museum Services is a wealth of information. Um, I have a resources PDF available here at the webinar. Um, and I know that they're uh, probably going to share it in the email they send out afterwards. So if you do have an up to date CMP, well, yay! It will help you make the many difficult decisions along the way during the inventory project, from incidences of missing objects and undocumented objects or found in collections, FICs, to security and who should be allowed in the collection storage area. Best practices dictates that the CMP should clearly state the purpose of your organization and its collecting goals the method of acquiring objects, the method of disposing of objects, the care and control of objects, access to the collections, the records to be kept of all the activities such as loans or exhibitions, and when records are to be made and where they are maintained. So as you can see, a really good CMP will give you huge guidance during inventory project. 
step two in planning, um, you want to articulate the plan by determining your scope. The big questions of how long the inventory will take and how much will it cost will depend heavily on your scope. The more ambitious the scope is, the more time and resources it will need. Although I must tell you that additional investment to broaden your scope will usually pay off many times over, such as taking a digital image of the objects as you go through. Now, this is a whole other set of procedures that you're gonna wanna research and would probably constitute a whole nother webinar. So I'm not gonna get into all of the logistics of digitization here, but digital images can be a very sexy outcome of doing an inventory. Um, I say sexy because I have not spoken to a director or a board member who doesn't want images of the collection items. Whether it's the theory on less handling and preservation or thinking digitization will save us all. I know having images goes far in getting support for an inventory project. As I mentioned earlier, images can be used for social media posts, marketing, and more. And nowadays, really, people just expect to be able to research or browse collections on the internet from wherever they may be. So digitizing your collection is a huge consideration for public access. Um, but you want to have at least um, the basic amount of information gathered uh, during your inventory. And I suggest the first four on this list, the unique catalog number associated with the object, its location, which uh, we'll get into locations a little bit uh, more later, uh, brief description or tombstone information. And most people, tombstones are the you know type of label where you have at least the artist, maker, title, and medium. Um, then you wanna have the date and the name of the person doing the inventory. Uh, pictured here is the inventory sheet we used during the first phase of our inventory. We, at the top, we have the room number, the location within that room, the date, and the name at the top, as well as the number of pages for that location. And in this example, it is page one of eight, meaning there is eight pages worth of objects in that one location. Um, we would go back and put that number, you know, that eight number after we finished uh, inventorying that one location. Then in the spreadsheet body, we have recorded the object number, um, which for us is a catalog number, the item type, a brief description and dimensions. And then the last two columns we used during the reconciliation phase. Um, we also decided to do a reboxing effort during our inventory. As we went along from location to location, we noted the storage condition and would create better storage situations for objects. And uh, this effort created a need for more supplies, such as archival boxes and bags, epiphone, blue board, you know, file folders. So a uh, budget for supplies had to be considered and it did add time to the whole project. So um, you'll just, you'll wanna define what will be your standard inventory record and, and that will help determine your scope. Uh, planning step three, uh, the resources and constraints to consider for an inventory project include these two things. Um, you can use for staffing, uh, can you use current staff and divert their energy towards this project? Uh, especially where the use of existing staff is required, can they dedicate a certain amount of time, like two days a week? to that inventory project? Um, or will you need to hire interns or seek volunteers? Will the staff work in teams or independently? Um, it's usually best to have two people work together for safety and risk management concerns, especially when moving or handling objects. So it's something to consider. Uh, will there be specialized staff or do you cross train? Uh, for example, do you train one person for photography or do you train all of the interns to do it? And then I'll speak more, uh, a little bit more about training um, later on in the preparation 
segment. Um, and then as far as movement, um, can you close off the collection storage area to the inventory staff only? It's effective in keeping, you know, the whole less cooks in the kitchen, as they say, but I know a lot of times it's just not feasible, but also for object safety and accuracy concerns, um, it's really great to have things closed off. But if loans, programming, and exhibitions have to keep going, inventory project will be a little more difficult. So communication between your registrar's office and the inventory team will be really important and key to capturing all of the objects in the inventory. For planning for step is documentation. Um, you need to consider how you want to document it. If it's on computers, do you have a CMS already? Can you enter your info um, directly into that CMS? Are there actually records for every object already in the CMS? Will there need to be data updates, such as you know, retroactively updating from an annotated location report? Some people can make use of a database that is not a bespoke uh, collection management system but some version of data storage, such as an external hard drive with all your images and spreadsheets, or perhaps a web hosted spreadsheet. So if having a CMS is not in your foreseeable future, the use of an Excel spreadsheet or even a Google Sheet could be an option. We used a hybrid method for our inventory, which went from the handwritten inventory sheets to a web hosted database, then eventually uploaded to a CMS. Our inventory project was a means to advocate for a CMS. So we completed the inventory on the handwritten sheets as you saw in that pre previous photo. All the handwritten data had to be input into the web hosted spreadsheet which took four interns about five months. So you'll remember to add this to your timeline if considering handwritten inventory. Um, we did eventually get a CMS and all the data on the web hosted spreadsheet was able to be transferred and uploaded to the CMS. Um, I will talk a little further about data and standardize, standardizing your fields uh, later on. Um, then, uh, in documentation, the decision on digitizing, and I have talked uh, about some of the pros of taking images during the inventory, but digitizing is a whole thing in itself. So some of the considerations are listed here. It will add time and slow down the process. It is a complex process where there will need to be training on file naming, and uploading, storing, and archiving. So you'll need more funding probably for hardware and software and possibly uh, staffing you know, just for that. You could have staff take quick snapshots of objects you know, like in C2, or do you need to set up a more professional studio with lighting and backdrop? Um, then the more professional the digital image is, it usually renders a larger digital file. So that's a consideration also with storage. Planning step five, the logistical side of doing an inventory um, has you looking at space and equipment. So do you have enough space in your storage area to examine objects, meaning like literal space for a person to move around and see the objects and take measurements and record the information? For the Utah State History Inventory, we were handwriting the inventory data, which minimized the space needed as we did not need space for computers or tables and power sources as we moved around through the locations and storage. But I have seen some storage areas that are filled to capacity and walkways that are kept to a minimum. So maybe do you need to dedicate a space elsewhere outside of your storage? Creating a designated space by maybe cordoning off a room or uh, closing a gallery and using that. So will you need to move objects? 
and how will the object's movement be done? And that kind of speaks to the equipment that you need. Um, do you have carts or pallet jacks to move your objects? Will you need some temporary shelving units like rolling wire racks? Um, you'll probably need to have tables, clipboards, um, camera if you're doing that. Um, do you need to get computers or maybe tablets? Um, and then for them, you're going to need power supplies and maybe internet or Wi-Fi. So uh, when you're going over your equipment, just kind of make lists for yourself because that will also speak to your budget. Once you have gone through these planning steps, you should test out your procedures that you planned. Do a trial run with a sampling of types, like uh, maybe one shelf or a cabinet, and then record the length of time it takes you to inventory um, that shelf or cabinet, as well as different kinds of uh, documentation, um, like small items where hundreds of things fit in one drawer, such as pins and badges, compared to larger objects like furniture, compared to complicated examinations such as uniforms and boxes, where you're taking out multiple things from a box and then having to put it back in the box. So also, if you are digitizing, you want to record how long this takes from setup and moving objects to file naming and uploading so that you understand on that time uh, just for that. And this exercise will bring out so many questions you had not thought of, and it will give you insights on streamlining your process. The testing will give you numbers to estimate with more confidence about how long the whole inventory project will take. But as with all the best laid plans, there will be bumps in the road that can throw off your timeline. So, you know, there's things like an earthquake or perhaps a pandemic or staff turnover. So you want to add a contingency to your timeline. If you're a small organization and you calculate your collection inventory would take maybe a year. I mean, I would add three months to that at a minimum. If you were like us, considered a mid-sized collection, we figured three years and it took us almost five. Um, so there, there will be, you know, unforeseen things that just get added or slow you down. So definitely add some contingency time. So once your planning and testing phase of your inventory project has been done, you can hopefully create and correlate all of your info and ideas to make a proposal with a budget. This exercise will help to answer a lot of the questions that will be asked of you um, from your boss to your board or maybe even your larger institution, as in our case with our larger state department that oversees our division but ultimately it educates up. The timeline and budget presented in a professional proposal will present your plan succinctly, and it will also force you to you know, see the big picture and then uh, help keep you from being bogged down in you know, all the minutia that is now taking up your brain space because of your planning process. Um, once you have done your planning and testing and then hopefully created that proposal and budget, you can start preparing. And to do this, you just you want to get organized. You want to organize your records, you want to organize the storage space and create locations if those are not um, designated already. And you will need to create an inventory manual and build your team. I can kind of get into each one of these uh, preparation steps. So you need to get your records organized and make sure that the data is up to date. If you are using hard copy records, as in paper files, you'll want them to be organized in some fashion if they are not already, as in numerically or chronologically. So our bank of file cabinets holding our records were organized by catalog number, which correlated to um, the chronological date pattern. So you'll want 
the inventory staff to have access to these records as well. So you'll have to allow for this and whether that's, you know, setting up a uh, workstation near your records or bringing the records to the inventory staff where they're, where they're working. Um, and if you're using direct input into your CMS, uh, you may need to go in and do some preparatory cleanup or scrubbing. And uh, you may want to create a, a screen that's specific to your inf inventory data entry. So you can get around, like if some of you are familiar with different CMSs, then you have to go from screen to screen or switch between modules. And you'll save a lot of time if you create that um, inventory specific screen. And it also, uh, decreases the pop possibility of errors. Um, if you're using a spreadsheet like Excel, you'll want to determine your data fields and employ drop-down lists to control your vocabulary and decrease typos. And especially if you are starting from scratch, you'll want to use a controlled vocabulary. And the standard is Chen Hall's nomenclature, now in version four. So pictured here is that nomenclature 4.0 book, and it's the most up-to-date print edition of one of North America's most popular controlled vocabularies. And it's for classifying and naming objects in um, mostly in historical museums, but they, they use them elsewhere as well. Uh, nomenclature provides a system designed to consistently name objects and facilitate sharing that information with staff and researchers, other institutions, and the public. It, um, it groups items in hierar hierarchical levels. Sorry, I have a hard time with that word. Um, and it's based on object function. So there are other controlled vocabularies that you could use, but you want to decide now. So think about using your inventory spreadsheet into the future. So Having a standardized vocabulary will make your queries and your reports more accurate and easier to use. Then you wanna consider how you will store your digital document. Will it be backed up, say, to an external hard drive? And will it be password prote protected? Um, I suggest both of these. Um, Having a password protection to restrict who is allowed access is a really good idea because you want those with access to be trained in its use. Um, this is an example of the spreadsheet we used and it's showing that location column with its drop-down menu. So this is a controlled vocabulary within that drop-down menu and it's making it easier and faster for data entry. And then you know, this was uh, just blank, obviously not filled out. And then here is an example um, of two screen captures off of the current CMS that we use, where the nomenclature 4.0 is already interfaced into the database. On the left-hand side, it shows the hierarchy of terms um, being selected for an artwork. And then on the right-hand side, it shows the hierarchy of terms being um, chosen for clothing and in, in the textile collection, which uh, this example shows a coat. So you're going from personal object to clothing to main garment to coat and then the type of coat. And this way you don't have a variety of terms being used for the same object. So uh, preparation step number two, organize your storage area. So naming the locations for where your objects are is really important. And uh, you wanna create a location authority that goes from general or larger to specific or smaller. Our locations were done by the hierarchy of a building and then a room within the building to an area within the room to the shelving unit, then to the shelf or drawer within the unit. So you're kind of, again, going from general to specific. Um, and then we physically labeled our areas and you wanna do that 
we we did it by uh, we labeled our floors uh, areas that housed you know things up on pallets and large objects by just using blue tape on the floor, um, and then we you know used a label maker just to put labels on our shelving units so each shelf had its own location. Um, so then you'll want to create a map. Um, we ended up creating hand-drawn maps because we didn't have um, uh, computer software to create something like that, but it, it worked fine. And then we scanned those in to save on our computer. Um, there's some examples of, uh, on the left-hand side, a room map that we created with all of the larger area locations within that room. Um, and then the picture on the right is um, a shelf. So that is the unit location on that shelf. And then there is an example of our flow lo floor location with blue tape. Um, and yeah, th these, these worked great for us. An inventory manual. Uh, you'll want to produce this because it's great for your staff who's doing the inventory. It's a place for them to reference all of their directives. So you want to let them know how will you how will you document objects with multiple components, say, or do you enter each component on its own line or in its own record entry? And then things like how to document objects without a number found on it. You may want some directives on vocabulary to be used for a condition or an object type, like the diagram shown here with a piece of furniture and its properly named parts. Having object handling procedures is also good to have in the manual. Um, that seems really basic, but you'd be surprised um, how going over proper object handling is really important and it's important for the safety of all concerned being the people and the objects and then um, you want to put in there how should measurements be taken so you know like 2d objects compared to 3d objects are you using decimals or fractions are you saying two and a half or are you saying 2.5 so you just kind of want to be clear and put everything in there so that there's um, uniformity across the board. And I think that's an example of our um, location. Uh, I think we gave them all um, little abbreviated terms. And so we gave an index of what those abbreviated terms were in also in our inventory manual. So now that you've prepared your locations and got a manual and what supplies you need, as well as the hows and whys of your inventory project, it's time to assemble your team. So if you hire interns, you will want to have job descriptions and you know, then you have those to put the word out and hope for some folks who want to get experience working with collections or maybe someone with photography experience, if that is something you decided on. If you are using internal or existing staff, you will want to schedule a designated time for the project because we all know how workloads change and all of a sudden your bandwidth is just not there. And, you know, doing inventory can get tedious um, there's times where folks are just waiting around for their teammates to move and position objects or take measurements and there's the ability for inventory to be put off for more important things as they say so just you know remember to make it fun you want to celebrate those milestones i know uh, we did little things like we put a copy of the room map up on the wall and we would go over and cross off in red when we finished an area or a shelving unit. And this was surprisingly rejuvenating. And we would maybe celebrate by walking over to the nearest bakery and getting a treat. Um, another thing we did was to pick the most recent favorite object we came across and share it with each other. It was really fun to kind of 
get into the history and understanding of the objects. And it, it, it really made um, for big picture uh, enjoyment and understanding of the collection. And then we actually ended up making a small display in our lobby with the favorite things that we chose um, by each intern or intern, sorry. Another reminder is to work with your individual strengths. Um, you know, I mean, if one person's handwriting is terrible, have them do another job to, that's to their liking. Maybe it's taking measurements or doing data entry. And, you know, overall the team will be more productive and get through the project faster. So don't forget those little things. Now you are ready to start your inventory. Uh, you set your goals, you went through the planning stages and the preparatory steps, and now you just have to do it. And by the time you get here, the actual doing of the inventory may be a, a welcome activity, but um, make sure to take your time and be methodical. Uh, we went from location to location and inventoried everything. Then we went to our records and reconciled the information. And I know um, I know a lot of other folks out there recommend doing just the opposite. They go to their records first and then go to the physical objects. But we did not have a working CMS at the time and locations were not recorded with any accuracy in the paper records. So the actual documenting of objects um, took us a little over a year and you know we had some bumps along the way good and bad that slowed down our process but overall the team moved very quickly and uh, we're really happy with the outcome so we uh, inventoried you know over 30,000 objects and uh, you know, it went pretty smoothly um, but once you do the inventory you're gonna um, as I touched on a couple slides ago the reconciliation process can take really just as long and probably longer than the actual inventory. So as you know, in a perfect world, you'll have a match of records to objects and everything will just fit into place. But we all know that that's probably not the case and it's more likely that you will be left with two main groups. You'll have objects with no record and records with no object. Our protocol was during our inventory that when you found an object without a catalog number on it anywhere, then it was giving what we called a temporary number. So we started a separate binder for all of the inventory records of temporary numbers. So during our reconciliation, when a record was found and it did not have a corresponding object, we went to that temporary number inventory and began our detective work from there. Um, we did a large amount of detective work to match objects to their records. Um, I would guess we spent two years with three interns just working, um, oh, they were working part-time, but they were just working on record reconciliation. Uh, some of the culprits we came across are listed here. Um, you know, with undocumented objects, sometimes they were just old exhibition props um, or old office supplies and equipment or staff awards. Um, there were unprocessed donations, or you might call them a backlog, and even just old loans. Um, and then when you had records that had no object, you know, perhaps they were deaccessioned and they just didn't do a bunch of recording for that or leave a paper trail. Um, they could be missing um, or theft. And then, you know, like I said, with records that had no objects, we, we did that temporary um, object number inventory. So we would definitely just go there first. So make a list of those for yourself. Um, to be honest, I still have approximately 1,400 objects with temporary numbers assigned to them, so it is an ongoing process. Once the undocumented object can't be rectified with records, 
is when it becomes an FIC or founding collection. And you'll want to differentiate between those two. Um, as FICs are the objects that have been well vetted and researched without any permanent records found. So FICs have their own set of strategies to deal with them. And you will want to research the laws in your state on probably on abandoned property because every state has different ones. Um, that book I mentioned earlier, the MRN5, has a whole section just on the subject of FICs. So um, again, you'll want to refer to your collections management policy on how to handle those types of problems. That's just a little uh, before and after photo of the same shelving unit. Um, before inventory, uh, things were just kind of piled on the shelves and um, hard to find. Um, and then on the right afterwards, you know, we, we reboxed and organized as well as covered things. And so the objects are much easier to find and they're much better protected. So now your collection is inventoried and you need to keep up the maintenance on it. Uh, the more active a collection, the more work it is to keep those locations up to date. Or maybe you can now do a more intensive condition reporting project and do conservation from the information you glean on that. Um, the research on provenance can maybe be updated or uh, delved deeper into. But this is all important work, and the collection is in a much better place because of your efforts, and the future for it is much brighter. Uh, so congrats on doing a inventory project. So this concludes the information I have to share about conducting an inventory. Um, maybe we have some time for questions. Yeah, I'm not able to see any of your questions in the chat area. So I think Leah will probably You know, uh, one thing I didn't really get into um, or talk about was barcoding and RFID tagging, which is another um, aspect of inventory that could be added onto your scope. Um, but um, like I said, I kind of feel like that's, it's along with digitization, it's kind of its own, own animal that you'll have to research and get into. And well, we didn't do barcoding or RFID tags at the Utah State History Inventory, so I didn't really have a lot of experience to speak towards that. Well, I don't know if we don't have any questions. Um, we can uh, call it a day and thank you so much for being here or maybe Leah can pop in and let me know. Yep, so it, it doesn't look like we have um, any questions so Thank you everyone for joining us.
Um, this is actually our last RHSP webinar for the year, and we're hoping to have some new programming out in 2021, so keep an eye out for that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.